Welcome everybody with a new webinar uh, today on Monday. Uh, welcome everybody here from Shore. My name is Barry Kassab and I'm a market development for MCA division. And uh, I hope uh, everybody's having a very good day and uh, staying home safe. So today's webinar is gonna be uh, a very interesting webinar. Um, as I said from the earlier webinars, we're gonna be going under the hood and looking inside the microphones built from the inside out. So today, uh, I'm gonna talk about the difference between two fundamental microphones that we use in all the recordings everywhere in the world. It's a two big territories. Territory number one is the dynamic microphones. Let's say territory. The other territory is the condenser microphone territory. What are the difference between them? How do you use each one of them? It is something we're gonna talk about later today and also in the next webinars. Now, knowing that the microphone is the fundamental pillar in the audio chain, like simply right now, if I don't have this microphone here, you are not gonna be able to hear me. So that means uh, without a microphone, the whole chain is, is not really working. But that also applies to all other instruments. So that means, if I have, uh, let's say, if I'm trying to record an instrument and, I'm my, and my instrument is not mic'd up or not plugged in, that means I'm not gonna be able to get the audio. So that means uh, your, your input chain is the most important part, of, part in, your, in your whole chain. So you start from the sound source generally. So to me or to you, let's say, I'm, I'm the speaker here. So if I'm talking quietly or shy, or I'm stepping away from the microphone, this is not gonna be efficient. So to be an efficient speaker before talking about the microphone, I need to talk about my projection. So going further in the signal chain, the first electronic part that is related to the audio equipment is the microphone. So there are differences between the two territories that we mentioned earlier, dynamic versus condenser. Now, these two kingdoms or territories of microphones they, they operate on the same principle, but they translate it in a different way. So to give an example, <clears throat> you, can, you can start a fire by you know, a match with the friction, right? But you can also start a fire by using a spark with a gas. Both will give fire in the end. One of them will be as big as a candle or you know, the match stick lighting up, the other one might ignite to be even bigger and bigger. But in principle, both of them end up doing fire. Now in microphones, the same thing happens as well, is that both end up translating or converting a sound, sound source or a sound signal, let's say, into an electrical signal, signal in which it can go to your uh, preamp or your mixing desk throughout the signal chain that you got. Now, if we need to understand more about dynamic microphones and how does that work, we need to dive below the surface of the microphone. So the surface of the microphone for us is basically what we see here, a nice grill with a handle. But what goes under this? So we go a bit of an anatomy here and we take the grill off. And what do we see else? Nothing kind of, nothing you can see that you can tell that what is happening next. But if I uncover that surface right now and we go even deeper, we will start to see what is under here and how does, does that work? So today's webinar is gonna be mostly focusing on what's the operating principle of microphones, the dynamic microphones, and the condenser microphones. Now, dynamic microphones also have a small compartment for slightly specially uh, used microphones that we call them ribbon microphones. They are also called dynamic microphones, but they operate in a slightly twisted uh, mythology that we will, we will talk about it. So let's start with dynamic microphones. The first thing about dynamic microphones is that they are transducers. Now, the word transducers 
is very important in my opinion. The reason why is that this is the turning point that goes in two different directions, but that center point in the middle, this is where it starts to make all sense. Now, an example of that is a simple speaker driver. So we've got a speaker driver here, close to the camera, very straightforward, nothing special, right? So how does a speaker driver and a microphone share something in common? Both of them are transducers, by the way. So a transducer is simply a device that converts an energy from a form to another, okay? So how does a speaker or a microphone become a transducer or can be called a transducer? So we've spoken about the, the, the basics of polar patterns last week, just to understand how the behavior of microphones is. So we, we've spoken about a bit of history with Shure and how Shure started the first microphone in his, in, 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 as in a practical moving coil microphone, and that was the cardioid polar pattern. That means it picks up the sound from one direction and rejects it from one direction as well. So the direction that it picks it up from the front and around, it starts to diminish as you reach to the end of the microphone where it's the minimum. I don't wanna say completely gone, but it's minimum. To demonstrate this really quickly, if I twist the microphone slightly off axis, you can see that my sound is diminishing a little bit. Once it's on axis again, that means my sound is optimal. So a cardioid polar pattern is a very simple, straightforward. It rejects the sound from one maximum point, which is the end of the microphone here, like an SM58 is a cardioid po polar pattern as well, uh, SM57 as well. And talking about the uh, the conversion that the uh, the uh, that was discovered in history is the idea of what is the medium that is used or how does the sound uh, travel so it requires a medium and different mediums uh, creates different speed so the most used medium for uh, transporting audio or sound is all is, is the air but that means the air particles themselves is also changing according or corresponding to the sound. So that means in order to translate how a microphone is a transducer, just like a speaker is, it simply converts a mechanical energy into electrical energy. And then an electromagnetic induction, which is in a dynamic microphone, is causing an electrical signal corresponding to the movement. But then where is the mechanical energy coming from? So looking at the air particles, this is how it kind of looks like. So now if I'm talking or I'm, I'm speaking to you even in person, hopefully we'll do that soon, uh, the air particles are getting compressed or refracted according to my sound which means the air is getting compressed as in it's a compressed area and a vacuum area, which looks like the drawing in the screen. So that means, let's imagine the speaker again here. If I add weight on top, what will happen to the diaphragm? Simply it will go in. And if there's vacuum, the other thing will happen the other way around. The diaphragm will just simply pop out. So what happens is that with the air pressure, the diaphragm will go in and out according to the air pressure or corresponding to the audio, or not audio, corresponding to the sound. So this mechanical movement needs to be translated to electrical signal. Now, the mechanism of converting a signal into, or a, a sound, uh, source into a mechanical is by having a stretch diaphragm. So if any one of you just picks up a uh, piece of a paper and stretch it like in front of you, like an A4, literally, get an A4 and get it r really in front of your mouth, like one inch away, two centimeters away, and start talking, you will feel right away the vibration in your fingers, which is quite noticeable. 
which is the same thing that happens in any stretched diaphragm in a space where there is air and it's not vacuum. So looking here, when there's an extra pressure, the diaphragm is gonna be pushed in just like I showed you in this figure. And when there's refraction, there'll be a vacuum in this space here or in the atmosphere, which the diaphragm will pop up or backwards. So placing the dynamic microphone to the audio source then would make it exposed to the sound. So just like the microphone is positioned to me right now, it's exposed to my sound. That means it's exposed to the air pressure changes in which it will pick up my sound. So to go in depth right now on how it is changed. So back in the days, they used to call them the electrodynamic or electromagnetic or moving coil micro microphone. All these names are correct. They're a bit more technical, like it's more based on the, on the physical principle of operation because audio is an applied physics. So for them to translate this kind of information into a name when it's first happening in, in live, you, you need to find the name. So the first thing they would call it, would they call it an electromagnetic or a moving coil microphone. So the Super 55 or the Fat Boy was the first moving coil microphone that was built in history as a commercial microphone. So don't get me wrong here. And as I said, it acts exactly like a loudspeaker in reverse. I'll do a quick test a few uh, minutes down the line and I'll show you how a speaker can be used as a microphone and but how does it sound as well. Now, let's talk a little bit about electromagnetic induction. Michael Faraday was the first person to experiment or to discover the induction or the electromagnetic induction. And it's in simple words, any conductor, any wire, simple wire. If I get one here, that is a simple wire. If that wire, is having an electrical signal passing through it from this part to this part, it will create a circular magnetic field around it. That means it will have circles around it, corresponding to what? To the electrical signal. So if the signal is going down from here up to my hand here, so we point it with our thumb, and then your fingers here will be showing the field. If the signal here is a negative signal, that means this is positive and this is negative, okay? You use your right hand, you point it this way, so the field is rotating that way around it, the field, which is the magnetic field, okay? This is a natural corresponding phenomenon. Now, the other way around, if I get a wire like this and I get a magnet, let's say the speaker has a magnet, okay? If I get the magnet here and I rotate it around the wire, okay? There will be an electrical signal to the cable. And that's why they called it electromagnetic or uh, electrodynamic microphone because it's supposed to be something moving here. Now, thinking about this in reverse, this is where the magic happens. So to kind of do something more practical here, because I'm not sure everybody did this during their school time or they were <clears throat> fortunate enough to actually have this test in the school labs, I'll do something really similar to this. So next to me here, I have a multimeter. Now I'm using the multimeter simply because it has a needle. The needle is very light. And that needle here can actually show me the, the, uh, the motion or when there's an electrical signal and kind of detect it and show me that detection. I hope you guys will be able to see that on camera. I'll do my best. So. Okay. 
Now, I got here two terminals. Simple as that. What am I going to do? The speaker inside has a coiled wire around the dome. So the dome here is literally having a, co a coiled wire, like a very long, thin wire. And that is submerged into a magnetic field in the magnet behind where the magnet of the speaker is. So that means it's highly in a high focused area or in a very strong focal area where the magnetic field is. So simply, if I connect these two terminals right now to the coil, it's like having that white wire on a detector. So what happens is when I move the magnet or if I move the coil in or out, you can see the needle moving or corresponding to this. Let me just double check here. Yeah, I can see it moving. So I'm poking the diaphragm just to move the coil. So that means I'm generating a, a small electrical signal corresponding to the movement here, okay? My viewers on Instagram. So for those who couldn't make it here, I just did the live streaming on Instagram. And this is the way I'm poking the, the diaphragm. So as you can see that I generated an electrical signal corresponding to my tapping on the diaphragm of the speaker. So this is where it kind of deciphers the operation principle of a microphone. So the microphone has a compressed version of this. The only difference between a microphone and a speaker is that the speaker's diaphragm is very, very heavy in comparison with a standard microphone. Now, I have a broken old microphone here. It's a SM57 that I owned. Uh, it kind of got exposed to a very harsh environment where it was very humid and somebody tried to put it back again. The cap was removed. Anyway, they cut the wire. And when the wire was cut, I thought I'll keep it as a good demo. So if you look inside here, you can see that copper diaphragm. And this is the copper wire. I'll repeat that. The diaphragm was that minor plastic thin layer or diaphragm. And behind it, there is a copper wire coil. And that big lump of metal in my hand is the magnet. Circle in the middle. And so you can hear the, the crackling of the, the diaphragm. It's very, very soft that even moving my finger around it can create the crackling sound. So what happens here is that it's a stretched diaphragm. It will correspond to the changes in the air pressure in the room. So what happens here is that when the microphone is positioned in front of me, the diaphragm is going to vibrate. And when the diaphragm is vibrating, it will generate an electrical signal corresponding to my sound, just like we saw the needle moving. And then that signal is enough to trigger the preamps in your mixer or in your recorder and getting amplified or being processed to become audible. So the reason why you hear my sound right now is the same reason. Inside this mic, there's a diaphragm stretched in a magnetic field connected to the mixer behind me here and going through into, until it gets to the codec, which is the webinar that we're using or the webinar codec that we're using today, and you are able to hear me. So in principle, it's very simple. I'll skip this because we already did this. There's a quick animation here showing the same explanation I did. So the green dots here is the side of the coil. This three arched red ones are the diaphragm. And when it moves in and out of the magnetic field, it will generate an electrical signal corresponding to the sound. And that's a side view as well. So that was the copper wire. This was the diaphragm sound waves in a magnetic field generating a signal corresponding to it. So 
it feels very simple. And with all honesty, if you try to do that at home, you can easily get that done and you will hear some audio. Now, what is special about dynamic microphones and why they're widely spread? Simply, they are fairly basic design. And when I say fairly basic design, literally any speaker can be a microphone and any microphone can be a speaker, by the way. So if I put a signal into a microphone next to my ear, it will sound something like a like an earphone or like a headphone. Is it optimal? This is where the question is, no. Does it sound as good as a speaker if I use a microphone as a speaker? No. Can a microphone be a good, can a speaker be a good microphone as well? No. I'll do a test right now and you can judge that. So it's a fairly basic design. Coil, diaphragm, magnet, done. It relatively has a heavy diaphragm. And when I say relatively heavy, that means in comparison with something else, with another territory, which is the condenser microphone. I will talk about that later and why. It has resistance to impact. Obviously it does. I mean, you can, you can drop dynamic microphones numerous times over and over again. And if they're ruggedly built, as in really well, well built, it will be very, very resistant to shocks and dropping and even water, but it's not resistant to tampering. And probably that's why this failed. So um, a lot of people know about the SM58 and SM57 being very resistant. A lot, I know people who had them for a, an easy 20, 30, 40 years, and they're still working fine, by the way. So they have a very good resistant to impact, diverse climates and environment. Cartridge is physically large, yes. So you can see like this is a very decently sized cartridge. And there's another factor, by the way, that makes a cartridge large, which is that is related, or we're gonna talk about that in the next webinar, which is the shock mounts and how the shock mounts work. So the cartridge itself should have also a kind of a, a I can call it hypothetically a dead weight to it. So it will not be easily moved, the whole cartridge. It's commonly used in live sound. And the main reason is the last point, which is capable of handling highest spills. But the cross point between these two last three points is that the durability. So in live sound, you have a high SPL sound pressure level and you have a lot of movement, a lot of dropping, a lot of chipping, a lot of, uh, it's, it's not a very friendly environment. Things happen there. So you need durability and you need SPL level handling, which means dynamic microphones would be the most adequate microphones for that reason. Now, does that mean I don't use them in studios? No, I do use them in studios. If I have a, a sound source that is generating a high SPL level, dynamic microphones work really well. So that's why they use them a lot with saxophones, trumpets, trombones, uh, percussions in general. Dynamic microphones work really well. In some cases, you use condenser microphones. Now, all these questions will be answered in a very dedicated session where we're going to talk about details of miking instruments. So we're going to bring some instruments and we're going to mic them separately and see what are the possibilities and why do we mic them sometimes with this or that or even something else. Now, I'd like to stop a little bit about SPL. A lot of people take it for granted. They go into spec sheets, you open, let's say, a speaker spec sheet, and you find the specifications of that speaker is talking about a lot of variables. A lot of people look at the frequency response, mostly. Probably, if they don't want to even look at the frequency response, they would look at the power handling and the impedance. So let's say eight ohms, 150, 200, 400 watts or so. And you know, if you want it to be a full range, at least to have a decent low frequency response, something around you know 50, 60 hertz onwards up to maybe six, seven, eight kilohertz, that makes it a very good full range speaker. Now there's other variables that is very important for us to know, which is related to SPL. 
So you find that speakers have a sensitivity factor, which is called or measured in SPL. And you would not know what that sensitivity is if you don't know what the source was. So everybody measures the sensitivity of the speakers when they inject to them two uh, constants, I can say. The first constant is the wattage. So they inject in them a signal with one watt RMS, root mean square. So it's not one watt music power or not one watt PMPO or not one watt of something else. Everybody speaks about the standardization in that case because we need to speak a single language. So it has to be a one watt RMS at a frequency of one kilohertz. So you cannot measure sensitivity of speakers at any other variables than these two, because this is the standard that they measure all the speakers at. And this is the way you can actually measure or have a contrast. So let's say I have this speaker, this we have it here, and they want to calibrate it or they want to read the specs of this speaker in which as a manufacturer, whoever they are, they need to know that all the speakers they do are built at the same standard and it has the same characteristics. So they put a signal here at one kilohertz with a power of one watt, and then they get a measurement microphone, which is distanced from the cone one meter away, okay? And then they read what's coming out of that microphone at that kind of injected power. And that translates into a sound pressure level. So the air pressure at that distance because of the sound is called SPL, because you're pressuring the air. Now, whatever the microphone reads will be put on paper. So you find some speakers that has, for example, 95 decibels at one watt, or you find speakers that has above 100 decibels or 130 or 135. Now, anything above 100 decibels is usually a loud speaker for PA, as in a PA system. Anything below 100 is usually a near field. So let's say if you're in a studio and you have your studio monitors, which in most of the cases you put them on your desk, these are near field speakers. So these, they do not have a very high SPL level at that same power. The reason why they made it this way, so you not destroy your ears. A lot of people sit in the studios for hours and they mix for hours. So what happens is if these speakers are very sensitive, that means you're gonna destroy your ears in no time. So near field speakers have a low SPL at one watt at one kilohertz. PA speakers have a high SPL and they are more sensitive. And that's why you can hear loudspeakers outside in venues from more distant points. So you can step away from a booth, let's say uh, with a DJ down there at least 50, 60 meters away and you can still hear the music not with a top clarity as in like a hi-fi clarity, but you still hear it well enough to tell what is going on. So again, hang, hand, hang, uh, hanging at the point of SPL is very important because I know a lot of people, they miss on this. Sound pressure level as in SPL is a translation of how much air pressure is happening because of sound. And that's why the P is an SPL, it's pressure, air pressure. Now, another point that I'd like to elaborate on is how do they measure that? And this is where it becomes interesting. Anybody heard maybe of, oh, I don't know if that ever happened, like it's a windy weather today. Do you think that wind is happening because of people yelling at the other part of the globe? I mean, I know everybody is at home, but let's say somebody on a deserted island decided to yell his guts out and create a lot of sound pressure as an air pressure as well. But have you heard of a wind blow because of a noise? Of course not. Any storms happen because of noise? Also not. So the way to measure that, because it's so negligible, it's close to zero. Like if I'm in a massive big concert throwing out 104 to 110 decibels of audio, which is above the, the threshold of pain. Threshold of pain is 95 decibels. So when I say threshold of pain, it's exactly the same way when I pinch my hand and it starts to hurt. So that's when you start saying, ah, ouch. 
that means this is a threshold pain. Unfortunately, our ears cannot say ouch. The only thing your ears can do is close the windows. The manual windows or, you know, the power windows, call it whatever you want. It's the same thing. So slowly it starts to jam your ears and close it down to protect your eardrums. So 20 minutes after listening to 100 decibels, you lose hearing at 4 kilohertz by 20 decibels. That means if you have a fader, you pushed it down by 20 decibels at 4 kilohertz. And that's why after a loud concert, if anybody did that, you kind of hear the sound as if you have your ear, hands above your ears. Everything sounds dull or dark. And that is the main reason because your ears got hurt. It's the same way when you hit your hand over and over again and it becomes numb because your system is trying to protect your tissues. So it starts to kind of pump the blood down there and then it becomes numb. Now, the reason why SPL level is measured with a different way than we measure air pressure, though both are the same, is that the differences are so little. So a difference between, let's say, uh, a one Pascal and a 1.000001, let's say, in air pressure is nothing. If you want to inflate your tires, you need at least the 300 and something kilopascal, 300 and something thousand pascals to inflate your car tire. Now, one pascal is 94 decibels, which is that close to the threshold of pain. That means I'm, when I'm talking about normal sound, like, like, like the way I'm talking, the fluctuation and the audio levels, while somebody like me talking in front of you, it's in a fractions of that figure. So the only way to measure that is finding a, a different kind of magnitude or kind of looking under the microscope. It's the same way when you look at microorganisms. So in the normal space, do you see anything? No, you need a big lens to go deep inside to see microorganisms. And then you go, oh, there's, you know, that microbe that is here. Now, in audio, the same way to put that lens you need to create another uh, unit. And that unit is called decibel or dB. Now, dB on its own means nothing as well. So when I say 94 dB, if I don't say dB what, it doesn't make sense. It's like saying I have a five kilo, five kilo watt, five kilo ohms, five kilohertz, five kilometers, five kilo Pascal, five kilo anything. Kilo means thousand, okay? And the same way when you say centi, centi what? Centimeter, centi um, could be, I mean, the only, the only unit that use centi is in the meters, but centi means divided by hundred. Then you have deci, which means divided by 10 or multiplied by 10. So 10 decimeters is 10 centimeters, okay? So a 10 of 10 decimeters is one meter. So deci means one decimal point. So when I say deci, that's a 10. Bell is the unit related to Graham Bell, who started the science of of sound today because he was the one to, who invented the first carbon composite microphone. So because of him, now we have audio and that's why they got this unit to be called decibel. But now decibel what? This is where you would know what you're talking about. So when you're talking about sound pressure or sound levels in general, it's a decibel. Now, if you're talking about sound level in the air, in the atmosphere, it'll be an air pressure Hence, it will be dB SPL. Now, if you're talking about a sound level coming out of an electronic circuitry, you need to relate that to voltage because what's coming out of the mixer is not a pumped air. It's not a pumped water. It's just an electrical signal. So to translate that amount of voltage into a sound pressure level, then we do something called dBV. 
And most of the meters that you see on your, on your analog equipment or the LED meters on your digital equipment or digital analog, whatever they are, any dB meter that you find on your mixer or your recorder or your preamp is most of the time reading dB V. And most of the time when you see it in the minus, it's because it's less than one Pascal. So you find the zero is close to the last part of the meter. So you have the meter, if that's a meter going up there, so it's still minus, minus, minus up to get to zero. And then the last part here will be in positive. The reason why 94 decibels equals to one Pascal, or that means it's one volt as well. Anything below that is a fraction. And in, in, in algorithms, or when you're speaking logarithms, in a logarithm, anything below one will be in minus. So that's why the signal that you read on your dB meters is always in the minus. Uh, this is slightly off topic, but I found that very important and very uh, kind of, it's a point where I need to kind of uh, share that with my audience. Now, we covered the part about the dynamic microphones and we're gonna do a small experiment here. Uh, go back or actually here, okay. So this experiment, I would like to test how any moving coil in a magnetic field can work as a microphone. So I'll bring my friend here, our beloved speaker, and I'm gonna make this a microphone. During the test, this microphone will be muted. So nobody's gonna hear the sound coming from this, which I tapped on. And you're only gonna hear the sound from the speaker. So how am I gonna do that? Just to explain, I got this jack here. It has two terminals and I'm gonna use my crocodile uh, cables here or clips in which I can clip it on the peak. So now I got two terminals here ready and simply I'm gonna clip them on to the terminals of the speaker. Has a good handle at the back. Okay, so first I need to mute this microphone. Now I'm talking through the speaker. Now, is it clear? Not very, it's very bassy. You can see even tapping on the magnet creates a lot of boom. And if I touch, even laying my finger on it, creating a lot of signal. And by the way, the gain on my, pre on my preamp here is completely saturated, it's maxed out. Okay, now, is this an, eff an efficient microphone? I'm quite sure everybody will say no, too dark. And if I, but if I talk from the back, it is again there. So knowing this, it seems like the polar pattern is a figure eight with more brighter front. There's a microphone similar to this to some extent, but we'll talk about that down the line. Everybody good with this? We're gonna go back to this microphone. See, I'm tapping on the original microphone and there's not even a single sound from that. So all the sound you're hearing right now is coming from the speaker, okay? Back to our old fashioned microphone. So you can see that it's optimized for, for vocals. It's not like the other microphone that I was using or the speaker. Moving forward, let's get to the other cousin. So I spoken earlier about the ribbon microphones that they are uh, dynamic. Now, how are they dynamic? What makes them dynamic? 
It's one simple thing is that they rely on the same operation principle of the speaker that we talked about. It's a moving conductor in a magnetic field. So when I say it's a moving conductor in a magnetic field, that means a motion created by a mechanical signal or a sound source. Moving the conductor or the diaphragm generates the sound. Now, in the ribbon microphone, here we have the, it's the KSM313, uh, an amazing ribbon microphone. Uh, it's very special. I'll talk about that in a second. Why? In comparison with all the other ribbon microphones in the market, there's a so there's a very special thing about the Shure ribbon microphones. Now, as you can see in the middle picture here, there is a like a wrinkled or like you know a wavy ribbon stretched in the middle of the uh, sound field of the microphone, and this piece of ribbon is a conductor. It's a wire. Okay, so that wire wrinkled is very thin and it's very light. It's stretched in that U-shaped magnet, just like the old fashioned magnet that we used to see on TV. The, uh, the hoof shaped or the U-shaped. So uh, uh, when the, the conductor is moving into, into the magnetic field, an electrical signal will be generated corresponding to the sound. Now, where is the, where's the challenge in a ribbon microphone? The challenge is, which I'll do now here as well, with the same input signal that I used, which is that jack. But I'll keep, I'll keep the microphone open here. So you can hear the hissing because of the preamp. And if I get my finger close, I'm creating that grid. You remember the white wire that I used earlier? So let's imagine this is a ribbon, okay? I'm gonna connect that just exactly like the picture is. What happened to the sound now? The hissing that you heard in the background, completely gone, right? Is there anything happening right now? Nothing. So how can I short the input and still be able to hear sound. I'm gonna get a magnet right now. Okay. Now you can hear a sound, right? Just by touching the cable with the magnet, you're hearing a very little banging. But if I do that with my hand, nothing. Okay. So what happens here is that because the the resistance of that cable, it's a, it's a short circuit, literally. And the only way to make a signal come in an audible way, you need to transform it. And that's why we use something called a step-up transformer. Now, one thing very important here is that the signal generated in that conductor, because that conductor is quite thick, or in, in relationship with a very thin wire, the current here is quite high, but the voltage is extremely low. So what if I can do an exchange? I give you current, but you return me back voltage because the mixers respond to voltage more than current. For those who don't understand the difference between voltage and current, I advise you to go online and just kind of read a little about it because a lot of people mix up between voltage and current. Current means the, the capability, but doesn't mean how much pressure. It's like I'm capable to do that much, you know, but did I push yet? No. So that means I have current, but I don't have the voltage. Once I push and I'm able to push that big weight, then I'm applying a voltage, okay? So the transformer here has a primary and a secondary. The primary windings is literally probably a one or one and a half winding. And the secondary is multiple windings. So it's like it's like a way to do conversion. So it converts the motion of the wire, which generates a little bit of a signal here, to a significant amount of voltage, which the mixer can detect. So once I use that with a ribbon microphone, which I'm gonna connect right now,
So now I'm talking through the ribbon microphone and you can see how much it's able to detect. Now, ribbon microphones are known to have a very good response to low frequency. And that's why my sound is more having a heavier low, it's warmer versus the standard microphone, which I'm using here. This is the SM7B, this is the KSM313. Now, you remember that speaker when I told you it works from the back side as well, slightly darker, that means the figure eight. Let's do a test here. If I twist that microphone to the side, and then to the back, you can see that the back sounds darker. It's almost the same way as the speaker was doing. So that is the front again. And this is possible because of the built-in transformer inside. So the transformer inside is able to convert the motion of that conductor in the magnetic field to a relatively detectable signal to the preamps of the mixer. Now, how are these microphones different than any other ribbon microphone on the market? As you can see, that ribbon is so soft. If anybody seen those physically, these are as soft as an aluminum foil that you use for cooking. It's actually softer than that. So if you ever tried to tear off a pack of cigarettes and take that little paper and strip the paper from the, from the, from the aluminum, what is left there is close enough to be the same ribbon used. So you can see it's very fragile, it's very sensitive. You can easily destroy it. And you can easily destroy it by even using it. So it was well known that you cannot use ribbon mics in front of kicks directly. You need to take it away from a kick drum. You cannot drop them. If you drop them, game over. Not only this, you cannot phantom power them. You cannot press the 48 volts on your mixer by mistake as the current going back from the mixer into the transformer that we see in the slide here, back to that piece of thin wire will fry it. It's enough to create enough heat that it will shatter. So ribbon mics are very expensive. If you destroy it, game over. And a lot of people, when they, when they transport them, they transport them with extreme care. Now, sure, was able to find a new substance instead of the historically used ribbons. And they uh, used a different material here called rosewoolite. This ribbon is as light as all the other ribbon microphones in the, in the market. So it has the same response. It's, uh, it's, it actually adds a bit more crisp compared to a lot, of, a lot of ribbon mics in the market. So as you can see, I was able to use it as a vocal mic and it's still able to pick up a lot of my high frequencies. Uh, the most important part is that it's extremely hard to destroy that ribbon. So you can phantom power it, you can drop it, you can put it in front of the kick, you can drop the mic over and over again, and it still works. And this is where it's completely different. Um, so we've sent it over to many musicians to try it, and we got a lot of positive feedback so far about these microphones. Uh, Still, the, the only part that is common between our ribbon mics and all the other ribbon mics in the market is that they are not in the affordable range. They are not as, as affordable as the SM58, let's say. But they are very special that it makes all the means of obtaining these microphones and using them in the studio. So you can use them as room microphones, you can use them as guitar cab microphones, you can use them as even vocal microphones, and they will give you amazing results. Again, in the next webinars, we're gonna have dedicated sessions about microphone techniques and how to mic things. And you guys will be lucky enough to actually witness this. Uh, I'll be able to stream the audio as well, so you can be able to hear it. If you're wearing headphones, I strongly recommend, and I'll speak to the marketing to actually send via email is that guys, make sure you're wearing earphones on the coming sessions because it, it, it's very important to actually be close to the source and not listening to it on a, on a phone speaker or, you know, on, uh, let's say, just a small teeny weeny laptop speaker where it's just good for vocals. You need to hear details and to hear details, you need at least a pair of headphones. So that concludes the ribbon microphones and the whole territory of dynamic microphones. Now let's move into the condenser microphones.
The only common thing between both is the diaphragm. Because let's face it, there is no way you can correspond a mechanical motion to anything in the sound here, in the sound atmosphere here. If I have a crowd, if I have an orchestra, even if I have a, a kid shouting, the only way I can pick up the sound from this source is by converting the sound energy into a mechanical energy. So that means even condenser microphones has a moving diaphragm. But where is the difference? The main difference is, is in the internal construction. Unfortunately, there is not much that can be shown like we did with the dynamic microphone because it's not as simple to have a condenser microphone versus a dynamic microphone. But I'll try as much as possible to show the SM81 diaphragm. So, this is the cartridge or the, the capsule of the SM81, closer to the camera. If I wanna take the capsule, the, the working capsule out of this, it's literally that last part in the bottom as thick as a probably two dirhams stacked on top of each other or two coins stacked on top of each other. So like a thick coin. This is literally what a condenser microphone is. Now, in electronics, the operating principle is based on capacitance. To make it easier for you to understand what capacitance is, and a lot of people might know about capacitors in electronics, and they know that they store a charge and they discharge that sometime later or within the circuit. That is, that is fair enough. But how does that help us in creating a microphone? Now, one characteristic is known about capacitors is that the charge changes by changing the distance. An example is if I'm wearing my new shoes, my plastic new shoes, some sort, so it's a leather top, plastic bottom, and you're walking on the carpet and you find your friend in Easter or you know in, uh, in one of the celebrations, Eid, Diwali, whatever it is, and you wanna greet him. So you know the first thing you do is you reach out your hand in the old school days when we were able to do that. And you know the moment you get close enough, you feel a zap because of the charge that was built up. You don't know if it's him or you, but eventually both of you get stung by the same electrical signal, which is called static electrical signal which is an electrical charge that was built up by charging two rubbing surfaces on each other. So if you have wool rubbed on the plastic, you create a charge. Just like when wind is rubbing on clouds, it creates thunder and lightning, of course. So, but let's step backwards just a little bit. That moment when you're getting too close to your friend to shake hands here in slow motion, the charge on each side of you is building up but in a different direction. He's building up a negative charge. You're building up an extreme positive. So you're going positively up, he's going negatively down. And that is creating a bigger capacitance. That means there's a bigger charge difference between you. And that zap happens when you touch each other or when you get in a very close proximity is these two going up back to zero. And you feel electrocuted because the electrons is passing out of you into him or out of him into you to equalize. Now, if I do this handshake back and forth, let's say I'm on a video tape machine back in the days of tape machines, I'm doing fast forward, fast rewind. That motion in and out, in and out. The charge is going like this way, okay? And that is the same thing that is used in condenser microphone. So the diaphragm stretched is actually plated with a conductor or, or it's, a, it's a conductive uh, diaphragm. Usually they use gold because it's precious. Not really, because it doesn't react to uh, elements. Yes. And it's easy to use for plating because the, the, uh, the temperature that is used to plate the gold is quite low compared to other materials. And it creates a very nice homogeneous surface. So the diaphragm is plated with gold. The back plate is just charged. So what happens is that the diaphragm moving in and out 
creates a charge difference corresponding to the sound. Now, when I say charge difference compared to an inductive signal coming from a coil, it's so little that you cannot even detect. And to create a permanent charge on the back plate, that means I need to supply it at least once, just like you rubbed your shoes on the carpet. Something like this should happen with the capsule. So instead of rubbing, I just supply it with a, a voltage from an external source, which is the phantom power on the mixer. Now, not all the phantom power on the mixer is used for charging the plate. There is another reason for that. So I'll skip the activity here because it's not going to be possible. It's very complicated to be done on a webinar, but hopefully we'll find a way to do it. So this is the capsule. The back plate is usually charged. That is the diaphragm usually con it's plated with a conductive material. And this can be a small diaphragm or a large diaphragm. We'll talk about differences and further down in other webinars as well. Now, let me, before I talk about small diaphragms and large diaphragms, inside the handle of the microphone here, there is a preamplifier or there is a amplification stage that converts that small minute electrical charge difference in the card in the capsule here into a detectable signal that mixers can correspond to. So I'll do a small demo. So I'm not talking to the microphone because there's nothing, but here, if I try to hold the phantom power. So see, without phantom power, there's nothing. Now, if I touch the top, you'll start getting a So that noise coming from the preamp inside, the, as I get just close, you're hearing that humming sound. So inside this bottle, there is a preamplifier that is actually amplifying the signal, the smallest signal. So even my motion, my hand motion in and out to that preamp is detectable. So now if I just plug in the the capsule back as in screwing it on the top. Check one, two, hey, hey, one, two. I'll mute the other microphone. Check one, two, hey, one, two. And see that now it's working just exactly like this microphone. Now, since I have this in my hand, this mic is the SM81. It's a small diaphragm microphone. Usually small diaphragm microphones are also called pencil microphones because you cannot write with them, but you can. it's almost like as big as a pencil. So these microphones are mostly used for instruments. The reason why, because this diaphragm is small. So that means it has a more accurate sound to the source. Now, the, the reason why it has a more accurate sound to the source, because the diaphragm is too small, it only moves in and out. There's no other motion than this. But the reason why they're flat as well is that there is no possibility for any kind of a wobbly motion. And that makes them very useful to be used with instruments but not any instrument it's the instrument that sounds good as it is and when i say sounds good as it is as into your ears you hear it you go like wow this instrument sounds amazing you want to change the sound of it no just use a microphone that is so true to the source so that means i use a pencil microphone example of pencil microphones in the short portfolio is the ksm 181 and a second 
KSM 1, 141, sorry, the 137 as well. And we have the SM81 and one of the affordable ranges as well, which has a very amazing sound. Imported knowledge from this microphone as well. It's the PGA81. All of those are pencil microphones and they have a very flat frequency response. The only difference is the KSM 141 that it has two polar patterns, the omnidirectional and a cardioid. Now, how about this versus the large diaphragm? Where's the difference? Large diaphragm microphones tend to have a warmer sound because the motion is no longer an in and out motion of the diaphragm. The diaphragm tends to kind of have a wobbly motion or they call it a rotational mo motion. This rotational mo motion happens on a lower harmonic to the original sound, which creates a little bit more lower frequency response. Or people explain it to be warmer or fuller. It's the same way when you go like closer to the microphone, when it sounds fuller or warmer, or stepping away, it sounds just normal. Now, how are these different and excelling for vocals and certain acoustic instruments? Now, a lot of people mix the information between the previous slide and this one. It's like, just now you said the flat frequency response, pencil microphones are good for instruments. And now you're saying the large diaphragm condenser microphones are good for instruments. So how does that work? It's simple. Let's go back to our ears. If you hear the instrument and you think that you need to enhance the bass frequencies on it, some instruments that are still new, the wood has not aged well, then we'll use a large diaphragm microphone. Sometimes the room is so dead, it absorbs a lot of the sound and you need to enhance a lot of the resonance of that instrument. Then you use a large diaphragm microphone. And with vocals, because a lot of us, when we heard our recording for the first time, we go like, why do I sound, why do I sound like this? For a simple reason is that your head is mounted on your chest and your chest is vibrating. Conducting the sound from your chest up to your neck to your ears. So your ears is hearing more bass than what actually people are hearing or even your recorder is. So when I record my sound with a flat microphone, it suddenly starts to sound a bit out of character. But when I use a large diaphragm microphone, it starts to sound fuller. An example, I can actually tailor the frequency response on this microphone. So if I change it right now, now I made this a bit brighter. And now you can see that it kind of enhanced the proximity. I feel closer. But when I turn the, the, the high boost down again, now the high frequency sounds less. So I was doing a demo before that was supposed to be switched on, but saved by the bell. So now you can see that it's, it's actually more present. You hear more presence. And this is an actual demo of a difference between a flat response microphone and a vocal microphone. Now, some instruments require that presence, that, that you feel close to the instrument. In Arabic instruments, the oud is a very good example is that there is no way you can actually strum the oud like, like you're strumming a guitar. The oud is actually, it's a very articulate instrument. You need to pick every, every string separately and you cannot over strum it and you cannot under strum it. That means you need to have a close proximity with the instrument. So larger diaphragms work really well. Now, some ouds will be aged really well, and you don't want to color that sound anymore, and you're inside a studio. There's nothing else that can be louder than the oud because he's a solo artist. Then there's nothing wrong in using two condenser microphones in an XY position and getting a stereo image, or even a single microphone like an 81 or 137 or 141 directly to the oud and you can add a room reverb to that and it'll sound nice and full. So this kind of concludes the part related to the uh, operating principle of the both condenser and dynamic microphones. Just to sum things up, 
the main difference between the two things is, or the two kingdoms, as we said at the beginning, you remember that the diaphragm on the condenser microphone is just the diaphragm. There's nothing on it, just a little bit of plating versus another diaphragm in the dynamic microphone that has a coil on it. So the diaphragm on the dynamic microphone is heavier or relatively heavier. So that means the motion of the two diaphragms is not the same. When the two diaphragms is responding to the same impulse or the same signal, what happens is that both of them, they will move in and out. But what happens is that the dynamic will move in and out again a few times before it goes back to its status, while the condenser microphone will go back to its status because it's lighter weight. It's the same way when you have a swing with a heavier weight. When you push it, it takes a lot of time to decay and stop. But if it's empty, it will take a shorter time to decay. So that means the response of condenser microphones to sound source is more accurate and it gives more details, especially at the high frequencies. Dynamic microphones has less details and less representation. The other thing is the, the sensitivity of the condenser microphone is higher because it's dealing with a very small changes in the charges and because it has a preamp in it while the dynamic microphone has nothing. That's why you need a phantom power on your mixer and sometimes that means you have more gain before feedback. We'll talk about that in detail and what does it mean on condenser microphones. So condenser microphones are more sensitive, but that makes them also not quite useful in, a, in the places where you have a loud SPL. Now, because also the, the condenser mic has a preamp into it, it adds some noise that needs to be measured, which is called the self noise. Now, all these microphones, all condenser microphones, they generate self noise. It's the same noise that you heard before when I opened the other channel, which has a bit of a hiss on it. So that hissing or inherited hiss from the circuitry is called self noise. Also, condenser microphones are not very good at high SPLs. There's a maximum SPL level that these microphones can handle before it starts to distort. The preamp. It's the same way when you crank your volume up and then you start getting distortion. So the maximum level before starting to get distortion is called the maximum SPL. And the self noise of the microphone is the noise that is generated from the preamps. Now generally Shure builds a very, very, very quiet preamps, which makes the dynamic range quite large. So the maximum SPL that the microphone can handle minus or not the maximum SPL, the, let's put it this way, the maximum sound source that the microphone can handle minus the self noise will be the dynamic range, okay? But in order to measure everything the same way, just like we said about the speakers, in order to make a proper differentiation, they always measure the microphones at the same sound pressure level, which is 94 decibels or one Pascal. So when you measure this, you will be able to, to find exactly what the dynamic range of these microphones at, okay? Now the self noise does not exist in dynamic microphones because they don't have a built-in preamp into them. There's no circuitry inside them. And of course, that circuit is adding more sensitivity to the microphone. So condenser microphones are perfect for mic inquires or a group of people, distanted uh, sources. You have a string section. You want to mic it as it is with the room ambience. Just mic them from distance. Or you have, let's say, the chimes. You can only just roll your hand on it. You cannot hit them to make them sound louder. So that means you need a sensitive source, sens sensitive microphone to capture the source. Dynamic microphones are more general purpose. A lot of the dynamic microphones can capture plenty of sounds, including some of the softer ones, but they would start to kind of be a bit annoying when you have other sound sources on stage that are loud and you're trying to crank the preamp up of that uh, preamp, of that microphone in which you can capture the sound of it. So, it's good to use the dynamic microphones with loud sources like drums, 
probably electric guitars. Um, so let's say solo uh, vocals or backing vocals, uh, percussions, uh, Arabic percussions, they all use SM57s. Uh, very few use Beta 57, probably they didn't know about it yet. They never tried it, all used to the SM57, but so on and so forth. Now, this is the major difference between them. Of course, the 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 complexity of dealing with with the uh, condenser microphones is falling into the part that you need to find the balance between sensitivity and and how much gain you're putting on your preamp. And in that case, when you say gain on a preamp, means how much your circuitry or how much your 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 signal chain is sensitive to the source. And this dictates how you can use them in either live or in studio. So down the line, we'll go through this in more details. Uh, this actually concludes the webinar for today. I would like to open the floor for uh, questions. Um, I think uh, my colleague Marwan, uh, he's the moderator. He can actually help me with the questions. If you can just pull them through and uh, everybody else, of course, is more than welcome to enter questions in. So far, we have two questions. So, the, and let's go with the first one. So, I'm totally surprised that talking to a speaker was quite clear and intelligible. Yes. So, as I said earlier, a dynamic microphone is not too complicated. Now, we're talking about efficiency here. Is it efficient? No. And by the way, for the speaker to be loud and clear, you should see my gain on the preamp. It's almost pushed to the maximum. So it can be intelligible and clear in a studio. You know what? They use them as something called a sub kick. They use them in front of the kick because the diaphragm is heavy. It resonates at lower frequencies. It kind of enhances the low frequency of the kick. Uh, a lot of manufacturers built those in, in the past. Uh, Yamaha is one of the very famous ones that had the sub kick. I think they discontinued that right now but a lot of people know about that. Now, there is nothing new to this. A speaker can be, it's a transducer in the end. Any transducer can be a microphone, but is it optimal? No. And if you try to use that in reverse, you try to use a microphone as a speaker, you'll be surprised that, yes, it works, but is it efficient? No. So hope that answers your question. Uh, there's another question here. It says, which instrument we use ribbon microphones? That is a very good question. So usually, because ribbon microphones are known to be a little darker than, than uh, standard other microphones, and when I say standard, as in standard dynamic microphones or even condenser microphones. Generally, condenser microphones are more brighter, crisp. They're more detailed versus dynamic microphones. So using a dynamic microphone on a source that is so bright, kind of sweets in it up. It's like adding a pad on it. So let's put an example. If I'm saying the S's and it's so sharp, if I put my hand in front of it and say S, you see it's darker right now. And the S's are not as sharp as when it's directly to the microphone. Now ribbon microphones naturally tends to round these up in a very musical way. So when you use them with distorted guitars, like in front of a guitar cab, or when you use them with the very bright sources, like even cymbals, or you use them with, you know, a female vocalist, it warms it up nicely. That becomes very musical. The other thing is because the diaphragm is quite big, it's able to reproduce a lot of the harmonics that are also very musical. So a lot of the jazz singers like ribbon mics over standard dynamic microphones or even condenser microphones because of that. Another thing is that these are microphones are very uh, it, it lacks the sensitivity, which makes them suitable in kind of keeping the operation steady on a stage and not picking up leaks from other sources. So that means you need to you need to have a loud source in front of it, just like a dynamic microphone, but that actually takes it the extra mile. So you can use it in front of bass cabs, in front use it as overheads for drums. And the the other thing that adds another coloration or not another flavor to it, if I would use a proper word to it, 
is because the microphone is a figure eight. When I say it's a figure eight, that means it picks up the sound from that side and from the other side. So let's say if I want to blend the sound of the instrument with the sound of the room, I will use a figure eight microphone, which is something normal to be in a ribbon microphone. Uh, this question has actually a lot of answers, and all these answers would be uh, explained in uh, how how to, how to mic sessions. We'll have a lot of sessions about miking techniques and how things how the similar source sounds different through different microphones. This is a lot of uh, kind of this is an experiment that a lot of people like to uh, uh, know about usually, uh, and uh, it kind of um, it it kind of creates a preference. And this is something I remembered back in the days is that I I always wanted to create a preference, like what makes this particular mic or this particular amp or this particular preamp or this particular instrument different than the others why there are microphones that are that much and there are that microphones that are whoa that much it takes me ages to afford but is it just the price point or is there something else apparently there is something else it's the same way with with cars why there are cars that are for you know 100k and there are cars for 10k are they the same no there is a major difference now is that a difference that you really want or you're looking for a car that takes you from A to B. So that's the same thing. If I'm looking for a microphone that is only to use with, uh, let's say, webinars, I can I can get away with any microphone, give or take, even the built-in microphone in a phone. Does it sound the same as an expensive microphone? No. Is the quality the same as well? No. Uh, the, the, the way it picks up the ambience versus your phone uh, microphone or, you know, the laptop microphone or even some of the commercially sold headset microphones as well as not the same. So not any microphone is the same as, as you can see in the build and in the application. And that same thing, that, that coloration or that, that kind of response that the microphone adds when you use it with certain instruments make the ribbon microphones completely different than anything else. So let's see what else. So another question says, does the figure eight condenser mic has two diaphragms, one on each side, or two capsules? That is a good question. So most of the condenser microphones with the figure eight has two diaphragms with a center plate. The plate usually is made of a heavy material like brass. And it's usually, this is where the most thickness is. So when I said, you know, the capsule thickness is, is like, few coins on top of each other, like two or three. This is the same thing. Now, 90% of that thickness is actually that brass base. So the base is set in the middle. It's where the screws is mounted and where they, the, the conductor is also connected to. On each side, they will have a diaphragm. And these diaphragms gets mixed together in the circuitry to create polar patterns. If that diaphragm is subtracting the signal from that one, then it's a cardioid. If this one is adding to this, then it's a figure eight. If this one is complementing this, it's a omnidirectional. So that's why you find a lot of the microphones with with a different polar pattern on the on the switch. It's usually two diaphragms. Now, to completely answer your question, if I have two capsules, it's the same thing. If I have two capsules inside or one base with two diaphragms, then it gives me the same result. It's just more mechanically rugged to have two capsules maybe to some manufacturers. Some manufacturers build them two capsules and they stick them together inside just to not have an effect on each other. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Can you please give us a link or something ab about decibel types and differences between? That's a good question. I will put together a uh, four links, which summarizes uh, the last two webinars, the one last week and the one today, which, uh, and with some examples as well. So there will be four videos. 
They are on YouTube. They'll be easily found. It's made by Sure. They're slightly old, but they're to me they are they sound they they sound and they look perfect. Uh, I'll I'll make sure that we send an email to all of those who registered today to get those uh, videos. And they will also explain about decibels. Now, a question here, does leaving the phantom power on a dynamic microphone is okay? Because sometimes the mixer doesn't have individual switches for the 48 volts. That is a very good question, thank you. Um, so, the mixers that has individual switches are always more expensive and more professional because this way you actually can have less issues. Generally, some of those uh, entry-level mixers that has a single switch for all your channels, and usually it's on mixers with less than 12 channels, uh, it is okay to leave it on. There is nothing wrong with this. The only thing that I would always emphasize on, if you need to plug any microphone, if it's a condenser or dynamic, and you don't know if your phantom power is on or, on or off, because sometimes even when you switch it off, the circuitry is still charged because there are, there are filtering capacitors that still holds a little bit of a charge to filter the 48 volts coming into your phantom power rails. So before you plug in any your microphone, make sure your mute button is pressed. You plug in your XLR and then unmute. This way you don't get that m massive bang that happens or inherited because of the phantom power. And it happens all the time when you plug in a microphone that requires phantom power, or if you forgot your phantom power on your plugged in a dynamic microphone, it happens the same way. So always mute your channel before you plug in or out your XLR cable. Next question here. If you can explain the direction of sound capture and how does it work? We actually explained that last week in the polar pattern. And uh, this will be explained again in the videos that we send, which I will summarize really quick for those who missed it. There are major polar patterns that explains the directivity of sound. So when I say cardioid, that means, let's say this is a cardioid microphone, it picks up the sound from the front except the back. So it's still sensitive from the side, a little less from the front, but completely or the least sensitive from the back. Another polar pattern, it's the super cardioid, it doesn't mean a better cardioid, it's just called super cardioid. It captures the sound also from the front, way lesser from the side compared to the cardioid. It rejects it from two sides, two angles here, and picks up a very little from the back. That makes the microphone very good in using it next to close instruments, which you don't want to get leak from, and also dictates where your monitor is gonna sit. Omnidirectional picks up the sound from anywhere. You cannot aim it. I cannot aim it to you to pick up the sound if I'm talking at the same time. You can put it anywhere. You can put it like this, you can put it like that. And omnidirectional means it doesn't have a direction. And then the last is the figure eight that we talked about. It picks up the sound from two directions and rejects it from the side. Uh, in the video that we will send later on, it will have all these examples and it will be probably to perfection. Hope that answered your question. Next. It's a following question to the figure eight question. Can this be used to make the ultimate shotgun microphone with a perfect rejection for back sound? Okay. Um, you need to know first where the figure eight polar pattern is. So in a microphone like this, it is from the sides here. This is it's a pickup pattern, so it's a one of the eights is here and the other eight is here. The shotgun microphone is a lower microphone. You can imagine it like, like a beam. So what happens, it's like a lobe. It's a very narrow uh, lobe coming up or corresponding to how the microphone uh, picks up the sound from. It completely rejects the sound from the side and picks up a little bit from the back. So, you can say that the shotgun microphone is a is a very morphed or deformed figure eight shape that has a very big sensitivity to the front and very least to the back. 
that makes the sides of that figure eight very wide compared to the ribbon mic that has the sides very narrow. So what, if you remember when I was rotating it, it has a very tiny or very narrow angle where it completely rejects my sound out. But it has no applications in terms of mixing it with a figure eight, with a uh, shotgun microphone. But with that mentioned here, it can be kind of used on a very high gain signal. So you have a stereo input, left and right. One of them will have the shotgun microphone. The other one will have the figure eight and a very high gain. Then it'll be something close to the mid side recording, but it's not ideal. So a straight answer to this, I would say no. You wanna experiment with that, be my guest. So hope that answers the question. Uh, I think that was the last question for today. And I think this gets us to the end of the webinar for today. Uh, I hope everybody benefited from today's webinar and uh, I hope it was very informative. Uh, my apologies if there was a bit more science to it. Some people might benefit, some people might find it a bit too heavy, but uh, yeah, it's, it's part of the game. Why not? Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll type my email here again in the uh, Q&A part or in the, uh, just may type a question down there. So I'll type in my email as a response to the first question. It'll be kasab underscore B-A-R-A-A at sure.com. And feel free to reach out to me anytime for any questions. And uh, hopefully we'll get back to you with the uh, with the video links so you can watch them and uh, get more details anytime you want. So thank you for joining us today and I wish you a very wonderful evening and we'll see you next Thursday. Have a good one.